Hello and welcome to Inform Friday. I'm Lila Angelaka and I work for HES in the technical research team. So for those who are new to this, this is a series of discussions about traditional buildings where we are presenting a short topic each time followed by live Q&A. So we'll be introducing you to our Inform Guide series as well. So each session will be corresponding to one or more of these published guides. Uh, and these are short publications giving technical advice for homeowners and covering the basics on a number of topics. The aim is to try and get you to appreciate the key things to know and look for when thinking about work in older buildings. So we started these events earlier this year by talking about what a traditional building is. We talked about traditional floor types, roofs and such in case windows. Uh, the winter series of our talks will be focused more around the impact of climate change to traditional buildings as we're heading to the COP26 event which will be held in Glasgow this year. So today we'll be talking about ventilation in traditional buildings and we will explain how that relates to energy efficiency upgrades and the risk of overheating. Uh, just to let you know, there will be also a separate session on energy efficiency upgrades and that will be in November around the actual COP26 event. So if you would like to, to hear more about uh, upgrades then. If you would like to ask us a question now, you can do this via our Facebook page or log into our YouTube channel with your Google account. Also, the event will be recorded and available to watch afterwards at your own time. If we don't manage to answer your question today, we will try to do this at the next session, or if it's something quite specific and not maybe relevant to, to the topic today, we will ask you to email us at technicalresearch at hs.scot. So, right, it's time to welcome our main contributor, Mr. Roger Curtis, our Technical Research Manager. So, hello, Roger. Hi. So, thank you for the introduction, Leela, and welcome to the audience who've come back. So, our spring talk's finished. Um, gosh, it sounds like a thousand years ago, but wasn't that long. Anyway, we're kicking off with the, the autumn session. And just to remind you of what we mean by traditional buildings, um, an image will come up shortly of a sort of two-story building um, slate roof, mass uh, mass masonry walls, generally sash and case windows, uh, intermediate floors of, of timber with the partitions of uh, studs, stud walls of, uh, of lath and plaster, and then a ground floor with generally with a suspended timber floor, sometimes some stone floors in, in, in the sort of in the corridors and service areas. Um, we mean generally a, a vapor open construction and a relatively um, high rate of air movement and circulation which is probably the is going to be the nature of, of how we're going to speak for, for this session today um single glazed windows as you you'll probably know and gable ends with with uh, chimneys and and flues and, and the chimney head that you can see in the image so roger roger can you explain to us a little bit more about what we mean ventilation in traditional buildings yeah, so so in, in ventilation, then uh, we, 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 it's easy to say old buildings are, are, are cold and drafty, and sometimes that's true. But what we're talking about here specifically is the movement of air quite often in through the lower part of the building, through the, the little vents at the bottom underneath, the uh, which let air in underneath the timber floor. And then the passage of air, uh, accident, uh, fortuitous ventilation or designed, uh, through the sash windows going into the room and quite often going up the flue uh, and out the chimney, the chimney can at the top, and then also vapour diffusion through the, the actual fabric itself, which we, we call the vapour open construction, sometimes called breathability. Uh, and obviously keeping this at a level that keeps our thermal comfort, keeps us warm, but also at a level that allows um, the CO2 that we produce through respiration and the other things that comes out of our bodies to uh, to be dispersed um, and through through in the air we're at, because actually an indoor a healthy indoor uh, environment is 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 as important uh, as a as a warm one. So it's achieving that balance, uh, and we'll talk through different parts of the building uh, as as we progress um, through the through the session this lunchtime. Yeah, so a bit, a bit of a history background, just a short one. Uh, by the 19th century, they knew about the benefits of, of open air and ventilation to both the occupants and the building. So this can often be seen in the design of hospitals, which featured large windows and verandas like the famous Nightingale Wards. Uh, so some examples are the Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh and our own offices, Longmore House, 
And you, you can see quite a lot of them. There's also Norda Handi in Aberdeenshire, which was burned down um, a few years ago. So this was actually, this design, this idea was carried on in the design of also later hospitals. Um, so they used to treat patients with ample amounts of, of natural light and fresh air. And when they couldn't actually have them outside, they would basically bring the fresh air and the sunlight indoors. Uh, so we're, we're publishing a technical paper on this, which is called uh, Health in Older Buildings. So this will be online soon and you can read a bit more about, about that. Yeah, so we, we, we talk about hospital design, not because we're expecting you to turn your homes into 19th century hospitals, but, but the principles of infection control in the days before antibiotics meant that they had to rely on what might be called passive ways of controlling infection. Uh, and that meant uh, sunlight, uh, as a disinfectant, uh, fresh air, and 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 high volumes of and often radiant heat were, were part of that solution, and so high ceilings, big windows were, were all part of that architecture of hospitals, and to some degree those principles were taken through into the design for domestic buildings, and and I think the the evidence that we're going to cite in the technical paper on uh, on uh, indoor air quality in in older buildings, uh, soon to be published. We'll, we'll argue this. Um, so we're not suggesting that um, you make your homes hospitals, but just bear in mind um, some of these factors, and particularly uh, in the light of COVID, which um, it, it needs needs uh, considerations for ventilation. But we'll perhaps pick up a bit on that at the at the end of the session. Yeah. So in 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 the design of both sort of townhouses and and tenements, you can see those elements of ventilation. So in tenements and townhouses in Scotland, you can often see those stairwell cupolas, and they were not just meant to provide light, but also ventilation and address overheating by solar gain in the summer, which would have been caused by uh, like by the glazing. So when these are repaired and made watertight it should be ensured that the ventilation they aim to provide is still open and remains unobstructed. And Roger could tell us a little bit more about this picture, actually. Yeah, so this is uh, this is a tenement in the west end of Edinburgh, quite a big stairwell, as you can see, and it's been blocked off with that little white strip on the underside of the ridge. So again, this is not howling gale stuff. This is just a very modest level of, of air change. And the principle of it works by the the, the the column of air which becomes heated moving up through the stairwell uh, and pulling the, the air through the tenement flats from the windows on the outside of the facade uh, through them through the flats um, and out often they had little very small windows opening onto the stair which were which were designed to allow this upward modest upward passage of air and and i think keeping that is important we're talking about overheating now re really in the context of climate change uh, Scotland is forecast to have much, much hotter summers. And I think some of you may have been experiencing that, um, particularly in urban areas where you have the heat island effect. And, and instead of uh, diverting to um, uh, electric air conditioners, which have a very high uh, carbon load uh, or electricity load on the grid and quite a big carbon footprint, uh, we can cool our buildings passively. And that's partly why we're, we're talking about this. So this is the cooling uh, for your own uh, thermal comfort but also ventilation um, for, for health, which uh, as we indicated, people understood very well back then. And I think in refurbishment, there might've been a, a slightly too heavy focus on air tightness as such, uh, and not on indoor air quality. And we'll draw out these themes later. Yeah, that, that, that drawing actually shows you those, like the passive air circulation techniques in older buildings that you could often see uh, and how the air, you know, the warm, uh, air rises up and how it would go and circulate and go out through the linings, the windows, the cupolas. And the... Um, sorry. Yeah, and the, and the hearths are, are actually part of that process, whether you actually burn a fire or not. You probably don't now because we've moved on to other ways, but um, there is an upwards column of air moving through that, uh, through that flue, which is useful, sometimes necessary to keep the wall dry, but also give a little bit of background air movement um, in your room. Uh, without having without having drafts and another and, and too much uh, cold air coming in. And in the next photo, you will actually see a traditional cupola with its original vent. Uh, so you can see all the elements that we spoke about and we showed you internally. This is external, 
And you can see that it's actually next to modern mechanical ventilation installation, which it's, it's quite, um, there were reasons why this was, this was done. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite a big installation and uh, consumes a, a fair amount of power and makes a fair bit of noise. So it, there, there is a balance to be struck in, in how you ventilate. And I think the, um, the cost of energy uh, and the carbon footprint of, of energy use will, I would suggest, I would like to think will um, prompt a, a return to, to passive ventilation techniques, which, um, which we know people understood very well. And besides cupolas, there were other features providing ventilation at high level. So we're starting a bit high level going downwards. Uh, and yeah, as we said, since the warm air rises up, there was a bit of a focus on, on that, that level. So here you can see a 19th century school, which is, is roof ridge vents still in situ. So it's a quite a nice example of, of that. There was um, a Glasgow designer and inventor called uh, Robert Boyle. Who, who who practiced uh, in Glasgow and he designed a lot of this ridge vent level uh, ventilations that you see um, was part not only his work but others were doing it too um, and he had a lot of um, a little working model that he'd show people to demonstrate how how air moved the other factor was back then in the 19th century they used gas lighting and that produced quite a lot of um, uh, noxious fumes in its combustion so there were additional reasons why they they had to get their internal ventilation um, uh, exactly right otherwise you, you you really would affect people's health this picture here that you're seeing is from a 19th century school uh, and invariably all these routes have been blocked off uh, and certainly um, overheating in schools has been uh, quite a feature um, and that uh, that's something we can look at Yeah, the next the next image shows uh, another example uh, from Rockfield, actually, where we supported the reinstatement of the roof vents. Yeah, so this is a this was a former school uh, in Oban, in fact, um, which is now being converted to community use, and uh, we spoke to the the architects just before the refurbishment was was sort of programmed, and we agreed we got. Uh, we supported them with the reinstatement of these vents to allow the the open spaces, uh, what were classrooms. Uh, that sit below the, the, this vent uh, to be uh, vented, ventilated naturally. So when the uh, COVID allows and they get events and things happening in these rooms, we'll be monitoring uh, the internal spaces to see how effective uh, the natural passive ventilation system works. Um, but uh, very, very pleased to get these vents back on as it, it's, um, it's, a, it's a really good step, but we haven't actually managed to test, uh, test it just yet. And in some cases, vents were actually, they, they, they were forming part of the interior design too, and they, they can be seen quite elaborate. Not in this case, though, because this image shows a blocked vent where mechanical ventilation was put uh, sort of on either side of the original vent. Uh, so that's from the Gallery of Modern Art, I think, this example. Yeah, so in, in, in a lot of modernization work, certainly since the 60s, um, a, a lot of these natural the designed natural ventilation systems and pathways have, have been closed off and, and replaced with other mechanisms um, and uh, I think uh, again our work at Rockfield will will hopefully uh, inform the the validity of of nat of passive systems and see if we can look at those being re-implemented in in several buildings both to, to help with the air quality but also to reduce the energy needed to uh, uh, and the embodied carbon of the of the of the uh, more modern systems. And um, let's not forget windows. Significant amount of fresh air and ventilation can be achieved through the windows of a building. And older windows are considered to be drafty, but unless they're not maintained appropriately, they can actually allow for some very modest air changes, which are, are essential for, for the health of the building and the occupants. And Roger, can you talk a little bit more about the design of the windows? Yeah, so so this this image here shows um, uh, what, what's sometimes called a hopper, and it's deliberately set sort of two thirds of the way out the window, so that uh, all of the audience and the folks sitting lower down don't have drafts. But what you're doing is letting air in higher up, which pulls the air, uh, the warm air rising up from the audience, and that disperses out through the the, the ridge through the hole in the ceiling and up through the ridge vent that you've just seen. Um, and you see this sometimes um, lower down with little close, closable openings at, at waist height. Again, all about keeping your feet um, free of, of, of drafts. And Leela mentioned um, 
about windows, timber windows, especially sash and case. On a good window in good condition, the air infiltration uh, through a sash and case window is equivalent to that given through um, through a trickle vent. So in fact, um, at that sort of baseline level, a sash and case window will leak just enough to, to give a, a, a modest amount of, of air coming in. And then if, if you need more ventilation, you crack the top down and you open the bottom down and that allows um, an air exchange through through the, the principle of, of, of warm, air, warm air moving up and pulling in fresh cooler air from from the outside. And I guess it's worth it's worth mentioning here that it is actually a requirement to have trickle vents in your windows, so you're effectively doing the same thing. Yeah, so building regulations do do a, a, oblige a, a trickle vent in in a, in a modern window. So there is a sort of slight sort of tension there. You engineer a modern window to be totally airtight, but actually you're required also to make it not airtight with with the trickle vent. So it's interesting in how um, in how things are perceived. In a Scottish government study done by Building Standards Division in 2014, it was established that a trickle vent alone in a bedroom overnight um, is not necessary, not actually enough air coming in. So we, we are back to using windows as they were intended, opening them, closing them again, depending on the conditions. If it's blowing, uh, blowing a, a storm or a gale, obviously it's all shut. But perhaps in uh, times like like recently, we actually want to crack that window and the sash open at the top uh, and open at the bottom to get that uh, cross ventilation going in. And besides that kind of feeling of having a sort of stale air in your room, can you tell us a little bit more about actually common issues and how these can be addressed through ventilation um, through the windows? Yeah, so just um, ju just yeah, so so we just saw on that particular image was was a where a trickle vent can go in, a, in an older pattern window. Generally now they tend to go at the top. It's sometimes called the window head and you can see the slot on the outside and, and the slot on the top. But um, often you'll get a clue that ventilation is not quite right if you get excessive condensation on the inside of your window, um, especially if the window is single glazed. Uh, and sometimes in the winter that, that will happen because of low temperatures. But if you're getting condensation in the spring and the summer, I think the, there's, a, there's probably not enough ventilation going on. Um, also, if you get spots of mold forming, uh, sometimes on the splays of the window, that's the bit on the side close to the close to the window frame, or indeed on the glass itself, or on the, on the timbers around that. So, look look at these signs of condensation and sometimes little mold spots, which shows your 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 perhaps your the air in your house the relative humidity in your home might be a little bit too high. Generally, a relative humidity around 60% is, is kind of okay, but anything more than that is perhaps getting a bit unhealthy. Um, as insects and things uh, do very well in, in humid conditions. Obviously, insects don't drink uh, from cups and mugs like we do. They take it from the air. So if you give them air with a lot of water in it, they will, they will have a better time. And materials with water in them, like wood or or cloth or leather or or anything is more prone to decay because the insects that are part of the decay, it's not the only decay mess, but one of them, um, have a good time. So um, uh, sometimes furniture beetle will, will do very well in a humid environment, whereas if it's a, a much a slightly lower relative humidity, sort of between 40 to 40, 55, they don't have such a good time. So they can't eat up your, your stuff at quite the same level. And moths are perhaps a, a good example of this. They're they're quite a proxy. I know Edinburgh is 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 often bad for moths, and but they come and go. Um, you know, my grandmother was always talking about moths and all that sort of business, and I thought, what are you on about? And then um, you know, I've had a few clothes chewed to pieces by these things. So it, you know, it's about the condition we the conditions we give them to live in or not live in, uh, and that's about managing and controlling your internal environment for your health, for the health of your contents your clothes your your woolly jumpers uh, but also for the for the the building fabric itself that needs to be kept modestly ventilated yeah and and similarly when we talk about windows it's also not to forget that there's there might be other windows that may have been overlooked in your building so the next image shows an example from Holly park lodge and it's the quarter light that we we actually reopened because I think it was it was blocked or it was painted shut. 
Yeah, so um, on the principle of letting, the, the old word was foul air, but, but let's call it used air or, or stale air, uh, generally rising because it's warmer than the, than the new air coming in from lower down. You pull it out the top of the building. So this quarter light is in the hall. It's not really about letting light in, although that's a little bit, but it's also about ventilation. And because I'm a bit of a clunky old middle-aged Luddite, um, we went for a hand-operated worm gear on it, which couldn't break, never never run out of batteries, uh, and the Wi-Fi connection wouldn't affect it either. So that's just a really simple piece of string, which just allows you to draw, uh, let the, the, the hot air out the top, and uh, pull pull in slightly cooler air at the bottom when conditions apply. This is in the hall actually, that the north facing hall. So a lot of the time it's it doesn't overheat at all. But we wanted to show people how they might be able to intervene passively um, as we approach what what might become considerably warmer summers uh, as part of the effect of one of the effects of climate change in Scotland. Yeah, so um, moving lower in the building, you can actually see a lot of uh, buildings have subfloor ventilation and external vents, so like this one. So we have previously touched on this when we discussed timber floors in one of our previous lives. Um, a ground level where the timber floor is in close contact with, with the ground, really, there's, there's a free moving air supply which is required to ensure that humidity levels are to minimum. And this ventilation is normally achieved by iron grills that you can often see in buildings. Uh, and these are often set in, into the plinth or the base course of, of your building. And it's important that these are kept clear uh, of any obstruction, like rising ground levels externally, which is a common thing that we, we come across, debris, vegetation, um, or them actually being covered up on purpose. And these are common issues that they can often be neglected when one is doing repairs. And they're quite, quite important actually for the health of the building. Yeah, and, and often shrubs and plants or, or, or stuff is planted up close. Uh, Leela mentioned the ground level, but also just be aware of the nature of the surface you're putting next to that. Try and avoid tarmacking up against things, sheets of plastic up around the building. All of that stops the, um, the moisture evaporating from the ground around the building. Um, but in terms of our talk about ventilation today, I know we've started at the top, which perhaps is the wrong way around, but, but certainly this is the generally the the route of modest airflow coming in. At Holyrood Park Lodge, um, which is this picture here, despite sitting in a very low part of Edinburgh, which is prone to kind of flooding every now and then, the earth underneath the, the, the timber was, underneath the floor was very dry actually. Um, and one of the works was to make sure that was really clear of debris and old bricks and rubbish. Um, we did insulate the floor, so we're not, we're not asking you to be cold. We're just asking that the areas of the building uh, uh, are, are ventilated where they need it. Yeah, exactly. And and actually, with regards to chimneys and flues, are, as we saw in the second drawing, which we'll show to you again, this is actually showing all the different ventilation routes. And fireplace and associated flues were and still are an important element in moisture control in the building and providing ventilation generally. So Roger, can you tell us a little bit more about radiant heat and ventilation through open fires and the balance that these two basically provided in the building? Yeah, so, so in the past, they generally, they heated themselves with, with combustion, with direct direct burning in a, in a grate or a hearth. And although the combustion products and, and the hot air from that fire went, went up the chimney, obviously you couldn't live any other way, but the, 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 the comfort, the heat from the fire came from radiant heat, uh, which travels in straight lines. Um, and therefore, uh, high ceilings were not such an issue if you were heating with, with, with radiant heat. Um, but also that provided the what you might call the engine to pull the air through the building. <clears throat> so I'm not suggesting we, um, so there was a balance to be struck between the air coming in um, and, and the, the level of heat that your fire gave. Generally, people in the past were comfortable at lower temperatures than we are. For, for them, an internal comfort was 14 or 15 degrees, partly because they were used to it, but also they wore, they, they wore more clothes than we do. Uh, nowadays, um, most, most standards are set around 21 degrees, and, and that, that's, a, that's a, a, a significant difference. And there are different medical observations about the nature of, of, of thermal comfort and healthy, and healthy heating. Um, 
and and warm air is, is is fine but it's not the only way of keeping warm and there are many studies that um refer to radiant heat having uh, medical therapeutic benefits um, and you can examine these principles in a bit more detail by looking at our um, already published technical papers. Uh, there's links um, which will be put in uh, on, the, on the chat there for you to perhaps have, have a quick look at. Um, so just, just be aware, and, and if you're not burning fires, which I'm sure you, you know, we, most people don't any longer, you can still use that hearth and that flue as a way of moving air. And it was very interesting to see um, quite recently in a, in a, in a a government sponsored thing from DCMS on adapting to overheating and improving ventilation in light of COVID as it happened. And it was interesting, um, hearths and flues weren't weren't mentioned, but but actually in a lot of our cities, there's an awful lot of them still around. And that might be quite a cost effective way of of just reducing that temperature in, in buildings that are that are now prone to overheating, particularly the higher up a tenement you are. Um, on the upper floors and that's where in Paris in that uh, in the heat wave I think it was 2005 the people who had the most trouble who suffered the most were the people in the upper stories of of, of flats and, and tenements so yeah just, just to add here that we're talking about radiant heat which is very different from convected heat so the radiators that we all have and use well most of us nowadays and radiant heat the main difference is that it heats the furniture and and any any element that it hits on. So it's it works differently. And with the ventilation that was provided by the fireplace and, and the flue and the windows, it kind of achieved the balance that was was needed. But nowadays, I guess we have different elements to think about in, in our rooms. Yeah, so uh, as, as Lila uh, has said, a, a radiator, the, the metal thing that we put hot water through, only radiates about 30, 40% of its energy. Uh, most of its energy output is is rising uh, confected air, um, so, so it's a very different way of of, of delivering uh, thermal comfort to humans. Um, where are we at, Lee? Are we on the chimney balloon so, stage? Yeah, so it's it just to also mention that chimneys assist in drawing out moisture from the wall core as well. So going besides the the room that we're in, so especially with exposed gables, where often water penetrates the building. So that they help disperse that moisture. So it's important that the hearths and flues remain open, as also Roger mentioned. And if the hearth is not used and it's too drafty uh, in the winter, one good option is to actually have a chimney balloon. And this can be easily removed during the warmer days. Um, so that's one option. Another option is actually a damper that you can you can see that in, in buildings, in some older buildings, um, which used to be put in sort of to close this is this is one that um roger made for our uh, building holly park lodge as part of the energy efficiency works that we did recently uh but you know you can see that these actually were were a common feature and that's another way of keeping the flu open when needed but also minimizing drafts yeah so this was um um and i i think i managed to get um in your epc uh, it works on something called sap points and uh, by the use of, of dampers on your hearths, you uh, you can recover some of the, you can get a few sap points for it. So I think we got two or three points for this this one alone. So it's worth having. By the late 19th century, they were quite canny about using uh, closing off hearths and sometimes the hoods, those copper hoods that you see on 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 the on the, the metalwork of a of a small grate, often in Glasgow particularly, um, when you pull the hood open, that opens the flue, and when you push the hood hard back against the metalwork that actually closes it off so you have a kind of inbuilt uh, design for that which uh, non people don't don't always appreciate and where fireplaces have been removed for example but the flue is still present and it's not been blocked a hidden mist grill as you as one you can see here um to put where the flue is is actually a very good option and again it can it can be used in the same way and be closed off when it's too drafty or too windy um, and this is, and um, yeah, this is a double size one. The, the the ordinary little tiny ones, the size of a toothpaste tube, are, aren't going to do much good. So we deliberately rather kind of overspec this, and and actually you put your hand uh, close to it, e even on a normal summer day, and you just feel air just moving moving up through that, which I think is probably about right. Yeah, and and just to move on a little bit towards other parts of the building, so. 
while the principles that we have heard before also apply to modern structures in terms of ventilation and to some extent they're, they're useful in, in any building really, but they're actually crucial for the correct function of traditionally built structure. So this means that where we introduce modern methods or materials, ones which are incompatible to the building, this can often lead to less than ideal conditions, which is what you can see here. And Roger can tell us a little bit more about this image actually. Yeah, so this is the um, this is the outcome of a refurbishment uh, in a former 19th century farm cottage up in the northeast of Scotland, where they went um, they went for a fair bit of air tightness um, and reduced the ventilation considerably. And there's a, a young a family there with two young kids. We had showers, you know, washing, drying, all that stuff. And modern life generates quite a lot more moisture internally than than, than folk did in the past and, and therefore the ventilation is, is is really quite important and when the relative humidity gets quite high or too high water will condense on a on, on a cooler surface and and that's that's sort of what's happened here it's also a material it's also the wrong sort of materials so this is a this is a, a, a very oily um, oily modern emulsion paint where the that the moisture has not been absorbed and, and desorbed over many hours. It, it's it's condensed very quickly on a surface. There's possibly a bit of insulation problems in this roof here. You just get the slight shadow where the where the roof joists are showing. So something's not quite right with the insulation either. But what you need you need two things. You need low temperatures on the outside, so your building component is cold, and you need a high relative humidity in, inside. And I think if they'd only had that little quarter light open, which you can just see on the on the right hand side of the image, perhaps kept that open half an inch or so, that was the natural ventilation point pulling uh, the, the the moist air up through the building and out, and and maybe that was that was sealed up and they just didn't use it. So it, it it's just how we use our buildings and and being uh, sensitive or aware of of the internal conditions, um, and and managing it accordingly. Uh, it doesn't mean you have howling gales around you the whole time, but in certain conditions, you need to uh, allow more air in, and in some conditions, you can close it down. And I think it's just being canny about uh, about how you how you occupy a structure and what your moisture loading in the building is. Yeah, so as, as we heard, actually, when designing thermal upgrades, it's important to keep ventilation routes open for, for the building and the occupant's health. And with these thermal upgrades, especially recently, air tightness is a focus. Um, but there's also the risk of overheating, especially with window upgrades and the blocking of ventilation routes. And this can also have unintended con consequences. Uh, and especially recently, as we've heard a lot about COVID. So Roger can tell us a little bit more about, about that. Uh, but just a note here before... Um, Roger adds on to that, that we will have also uh, a new energy efficiency retrofit guide, which we will get on uh, to the live on uh, in November. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but Roger could tell us a little bit more about basically air tightness and how that relates to overheating. Yeah, so so keeping on the theme of we're, we're going to sort of talk more specifically about um, indoor air quality now, but um, in all energy retrofit, there is a balance between how airtight you make the building and how much air you move out of the building uh, to keep the internal conditions uh, as they should be, both for the both most importantly for the people, but also for the building fabric. So we've been doing a little bit of monitoring of internal conditions in certain spaces, and the slide just coming up is um, is a graph that I hope is not too confusing for you, but it shows. Um, uh, an unnamed office building in central Scotland uh, where there was a reasonable number of people Monday to Friday and you can slightly see those those five um, those five day cycles you can even see on a Friday which is the the uh, the, the lower peak at the end of the sequence of five it is quite a lot less because it was Friday there were fewer people in and the carbon dioxide level is the red line the numbers of people is the is the blue bars that have been laid on um, and I think probably the, the, this peaked at around um, uh, parts per million for carbon dioxide um, at about 1800, which is quite high. 
the ba background level for Scotland in, in the air is about 480 parts per million. So 1,800 in a, in, a, in a hot meeting room on a July afternoon in Stirling will send you to sleep as well as being unhealthy. Um, it, Im, imagine that in a school environment and how the, how the, the young folk are going to concentrate. Um, the, um, the black line, which you'll sort of wonder about, that's volatile organic compounds or, or sometimes called VOCs. And, and it's interesting in, in modern life, we're now using a much bigger variety of materials in our furniture, in our soft furnishings, in our detergents, how we clean the building. And all of these will, may uh, generate or be composed of volatile organic uh, compounds, which are not necessarily good for us in, in high concentrations. So this is an area uh, to definitely think about. Uh, and, and carbon dioxide, it, it's got to be, it will, it's not poisonous in itself, unless it's at very high levels, but 1800 is way above the, the recommended level. I can't remember the exact guidance from, from the uh, mechanical engineering people, but I, I have a feeling it's around a thousand. Um, and you will notice that as you start yawning and wondering when this meeting is going to end. So think what it's like in, in crowded spaces where you don't have ventilation at all. Um, in this case, the ceilings were have been lowered, the windows had been virtually sealed shut, and the only route for new air coming into that building was when someone happened to open the front door when they came in uh, and, and they closed it again. So uh, we're deliberately showing you a, a not a great example to tr slightly try and make the point. Um, so so bear that in mind, and, and COVID has prompted um, quite a lot of carbon dioxide monitoring because it, CO2 is a proxy for concentration of well, general air quality. And of course, uh, COVID, um, one of the ways to reduce the viral load is to, is, to, is to ventilate quite heavily. So CO2 monitoring has become important, both for indoor air quality as a proxy for other things, but also for COVID too. So maybe that's, um, that's a takeaway for, for consideration. Exactly. And and thank you, Roger. So we actually had a lot of questions, which are very, very good questions. So we'll try to get through all of them just now. So the first question is about positive input ventilation, PAV. Um, Mark on YouTube is asking whether we have installed such a PAV anywhere to help ventilation. Um. We haven't. Many many people do in refurbishment, and, and that's a that's a design choice that that people are are, are very welcome to to do. Um, I, I would I would go with that only if if I couldn't do the job um, with with natural ventilation. So that's perhaps our sort of default point. Um, there is a cost to it, obviously. There is a, a maintenance cost. There is ducting ducting has to be cleaned and looked after and filters so that there are, there are things that go with it um, but it's certainly an option that people may may wish to choose in refurbishment yeah there's a there's a comment from graham on youtube uh, he says that he thought all windows from flats into stairs were sealed to prevent smoke blocking stairs in the event of a fire in a flat that's partly true true i think in sort of the more later um but i'm not i'm not really sure about that i i don't know if it's a regulation well how, how the fire how modern fire regulations are applied will will depend on individual cases but that's how the principle worked so um what what folk do now is is perhaps a matter for for the the, the thing also in in some stairs you you have you have you have smoke vents hatches opening so, so a lot of fire regulation is about clearing smoke, uh, not holding it up in one particular place. But I'd have to defer that to a, to a fire engineer to, to get exactly the right answer for the right place. Yeah, um, thank you for that. So question from Mark on YouTube. Can you have too much ventilation into the attic? Uh, for example, adding more soffit vents. So just explain to people what soffit vents are um, also. So this is about um, ventilation of roof spaces, which is which is fairly important, and there is a 
an observation that you don't want your warm, humid air from the house going into the attic space where it's generally cooler and then condensing on 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 the sort of timber areas and other, and other, other spaces there. And I think this is quite an interesting one because attics, ventilation of attics is a balance. Most people put the insulation between the between the uh, the ceiling joists and therefore giving uh, what is now called a cold roof. Uh, so you, you you can have a lower dew point in that space. And that's where the ventilation uh, at the bottom of the roof, sometimes called the, um, the eave level uh, or, or indeed f further up. And there's again, like a, like these other things, there is a balance in how in having too much and too little. Generally, the feeling is that you do not want uh, warm, domestic, moist air going into your attic. So this is about having a a properly closed off loft hatch and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so we have another question from Amelia on YouTube. Uh, they've lived in the house for two and a half years. The house was built in 1835, and this year there's a massive amount of damp and condensation on the walls of the basement. Are there professionals who can give unbiased advice? So that's for, more for a surveyor, I think, to look at. Uh, but yeah, Roderick, yeah. you can tell us a few points. What, what, you're, what you might be seeing <clears throat> is walls that are damp, and therefore they're cooler. And therefore, in the summer, when the general relative humidities are much higher, there's more air, sorry, there's more water in the air. You'll often get condensation on walls in the summer, particularly on certain surfaces with what I might call oily paint or um, on them than you get in the winter. The other factor on, on basements is that they've often been uh, so-called refurbished and they've often got a gypsum plaster lining which in itself is slightly hydroscopic. It absorbs water and, and therefore you have a sort of self-reinforcing. And at Hollywood Park Lodge, where we used a bit of gypsum plaster for the patching because the contractor didn't use the line that he should have done. And we had precisely that. We had little damp areas and we just couldn't work out what it was. And it was a combination of gypsum and summer humidity. Um, my feeling with that is you have an appropriate suite of of, of, of materials uh, and you manage the ventilation uh, and the dryness or the managing the, the, the water content of, of the areas around the outside the, the basement. Often with basements that there is a, a blocked drain that you don't see under the pavement or, or where the rainwater goods are coming down from the coming down from the roof. That's generally the, the issue at the core of it. Um, professionals to give unbiased advice that's quite a hard one because the damp industry is 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 configured to a certain set of solutions that are quite often product based um, I would suggest you went for a conservation accredited architect or a conservation accredited building surveyor go on the RIAS website or the RICS website to find those in Scotland and that's probably the perhaps that's the, the best way to start unpicking this one bit by bit um, Leela and I do have a dialogue with the public on this quite a lot. We talk about damp a lot. We look at a lot of photographs uh, and try and put people in the right direction. So we can give you a, a bit of a steer, but you might have to get someone out. Yeah, happy, happy to have for you to email us if you would like a technical research at hs.scot. Um, just to move on, we had a, a, a comment from Kieran, if I'm pr pronouncing it correctly. It's quite a good comment. Um, he says, but passive ventilation only works if there is a pressure differential to drive it. This relies on either a fortuitous weather condition, often not present, or some heat energy inside the building, which causes circulation by convection. But in doing so, dissipates the energy that caused it. So I wonder if energy efficiency and passive ventilation are not enemies. And I think that's that's something that we meant to talk about, perch ventilation and, and cross ventilation, that Roger can expand on a bit. Um, well, if we're talking about overheating and we're getting solar gain through the windows and the air's warming up in the building, that gives it, that makes it lighter. It, it, it has a desire to move upwards. So that is your, that is your engine so to speak and, and traditional buildings were often configured to maximize that um, you get that moving by opening a window so you've got an upwards pull often cross ventilation applies which which Lila mentioned which is why um, older buildings generally had courtyards because you couldn't get cross ventilation with a floor plate beyond a certain width um, 
and even if you don't necessarily know it, you often get a degree of pressure difference between different elevations simply because of the angle of the sun or the way the prevailing, I won't say wind, but air movement. Um, so I would suggest that actually you do get um, reasonable conditions, either if there's wind or if there's sun or a mixture of both, which is probably what we get in the temperate climate of the UK. Um, so I would suggest you can make it work. If you want to be energy efficient, i.e. keeping heat in in the winter, well, then you close everything up, um, but you have just enough to keep things to keep things moving, um, but not enough to make your building too cold inside. So just just to add here about cross ventilation and, and purge ventilation. So one way to to cause a little bit of cross ventilation if you are you know in a single aspect uh, building flat, um, so is to actually create different. Um, or open the windows at different heights. And again, that's easier with such in case windows that could be opened on the top. But if you have new UPVC windows, that's, that's a bit harder. And with approach ventilation, again, in order to keep the heating in, because the, the heating will actually have hit a little bit of the air, but will have hit your, your walls as well. So one way to address that is to do short spells of, um, of ventilation. So five to six minutes are actually enough if you have this cross ventilation to renew the fresh air whilst keeping the heat in. Um, yeah, so you sorry. do a bulk, you do a sort of bulk exchange of air and then you close everything up again and the the, the heat in the walls and objects and furniture and floors just radiates, radiates back. And you can sort of see that. So when you do that, you don't go to cold for a long period. It, it recovers very quickly. Exactly, yeah. Um, so we had another question from David on Facebook. Has anyone documented the energy losses in naturally ventilated legacy buildings? Much has been spoken about enabling used air to evacuate and be replaced by infiltration and metrics for calculating the entrained energy in this air change. So one thing I would say is do go uh, to look at our Holyoke Park Logic study. We have done some monitoring there, and Roger, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, we've we've not gone into too much detail on on actual energy. Um, I, I think you have to consider the energy consumed in a mechanically ventilated building, and I'd include the embodied carbon of the machinery, its maintenance cycle, its repair cycles, its cleaning and how quickly it becomes obsolescent. So there's there's more to it than than simple energy alone. I think probably our focus today is 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 conditions for the people inside and how we how we improve that. Um, and again, I'm not suggesting we um, we live in cold buildings, but I think there's a delicate balance to be had. And as the heating season reduces and the cooling season widens with climate change in Scotland, I think the the energy efficiency argument, as in retaining heat uh, in the, in the cooler periods of the year, will become uh, more nuanced with respect to how we to, to how we live. But no, I can't put I can't put too many numbers on this stuff yet. Perhaps that's a, a good PhD project for somebody. Um, another question from David on Facebook: Do we have any thoughts about the fireplace draft air? It draws this from the room normally when fired, but I think we kind of explained that. Unless it's something, unless the question yeah, came the, before the, we got to that the, point. The, the the pull for that works from two ways. You've got the column of of of, of warm air from within the building, and you've got the Bernoulli effect of air crossing the top um, of the top of the chimney head or the chimney can at the top, as we call it in Scotland, um, as, as a, the, the Bernoulli effect of pulling that up as well. So you have two, two mechanisms to draw air up. Um, if that's what you want, of course, you, you may not want that. Um, another question from Mark on YouTube. Uh, he did a smoke test at their fireplace and the room filled up with more smoke than expected. Perhaps the flu and it's cleaned out. Well, definitely that's one to look for. Yeah, and you can have a you can have a downdraft in hearths. <clears throat> so sometimes I'm sure some of you have experienced it when you're doing a smoke test or even lighting a fire. If you've got, got very cold conditions, that air now is cold. Therefore, it's actually a sinking column of air. Uh, and either you light the fire or you close the baffle quickly. <laughs> 
Um, and so, and it, question. Might need, yes, and it might need cleaning out too. There'll be all sorts of stuff there. And there is a flu condition thing here. I can't say that every flu is going to be intact or is going to work. And, and sometimes they're just knackered, and that's the end of the story. But yeah. Thank you. Um, another question from Sue on Facebook. How about wall vents near the ceiling at the top of the wall in a double brick home cavity wall? Many people steal this off, but I'm trying to keep it open. What about winter? Um, yeah, I've seen that, um, particularly in sort of end of the 30s, social housing, they had they had them much higher up. I think that that's so the drafts didn't didn't um, annoy people too much. And, and I think maybe that sometimes they're closable and sometimes they're just fully open. And it may be you work out a way of having it adjustable so you can you can adjust it for the conditions that you have. Um, I'm not suggesting necessarily a blue Peter solution with sellotape and cardboard, but but something that allows you to to manage it. And I think um, we're perhaps back to build tight, ventilate right, so you control the ventilation. Um, and I think this with your one, you probably want to keep it, but have it so that you can intervene and, and make it work when you need it to. Great. Um, a question from Richard on Facebook: Is it best to uh, room passive to I'm guessing he means to have passive vents at the foot or at the top of the walls which is quite a good, good question good, no good question and, and slightly related to, to, to Sue's um, question um, and if you have it all at the top um, I, I would say higher up actually because then that's that that is not blowing at your feet and when I say blowing I don't mean blowing I mean the air moving most of the time they're at waist height so at Rockfield, the vents for the classrooms were set just, just above waist height and they were controllable. Um, uh, by the late 19th century, quite a lot of fires actually had the grills letting air in either side of the fireplace so that the cool air coming in from underneath wasn't blowing past your ankles, but just sort of went straight to the bit where the combustion needed it. So I'd suggest it's a, it, it's, I'd suggest it's a judgment that, that you make, but... <clears throat> In an older building, as we know, the air will find its way somewhere. Uh, and it's just having that there's not too much and there's not too little. Exactly. And the, they both have the merits. Uh, I think we have a last question, uh, which is from Mark on YouTube. Do we recommend an affordable air quality monitor? We obviously can't recommend any specific brands or products. But if you're asking us about whether we recommend just having an air quality monitor, I think it's up to you, but it is quite useful as we sort of as mentioned earlier. Yeah, so for lots of reasons. So you can get um, carbon monoxide detectors very easily for, for, for sort of obvious ones. But probably what I'd suggest is a, is a CO2 meter with a VOC capacity. And, and those, so if you, had, if you had CO2, relative humidity and VOCs, which have within the sort of I can't remember. Anne will be able to remind me, but it was sort of 150 pound type mark. The tiny, There's, tiny tiles, I think. Mm, yeah, it, it varies, but but crudely, that you get them uh, uh, mixed, uh, tied into your phone, and and you can you, know, you can watch it very easily. If you want to go into if you want to go into VOCs in any detail, um, you start paying really quite a lot of money. But if you accept CO2 as a proxy for bad, smelly air. Um, get the CO2, have the general VOC one just to tell you your, your flat stinks once you finish painting it, um, uh, and also relative humidity. So perhaps if you keep your eyes on those three, I think, uh, and adjust your ventilation accordingly. That's great. So I think that's all we have time for again today, but we had really good questions. Uh, and if there's anything that's more uh, detailed or is a longer explanation, we will be replying to you back via email. So just to say thank you very much for, for joining in. And if you enjoyed it, you can leave an, uh, a comment. Uh, any suggestions, again, for, for next sessions, although we do have a few sessions planning uh, planned until November, as we mentioned. So the next one will be on the 8th of October and we'll cover rainwater goods and general rainwater management, which hopefully will be quite uh, good for that for that time of year just in time and in the meantime if you have any questions you can email technicalresearch at hs.scot 
And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Roger, for your input. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your day and your weekend. Cheers, team. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.